We've recently reached out to a company called Rockkey, who I came across uh, some of their products on another YouTube video and went to check out their website. Turns out they've got a whole host of oscilloscope accessories that are really quite affordable. Anyway, I uh, sent them an email and they responded with a big box of stuff. So let's take a look at what they sent. They pretty much sent one of every product that they sell. We're not gonna take a look at all of this today. However, I am gonna pick out a few of my favorite products that they sent so you can take a look and hopefully go and check them out for yourself. Okay, so the three products that I've chose to show you today are this Rockkey coil on plug tester. So this is for testing the ignition coils, similar to the old coin trick that I've showed you in uh, previous videos. If you haven't checked that out before, go and have a look at that. We've got a pulse sensor, and this is a pretty cool little sensor um, used for checking like engine mechanical problems. Um, you can get this for $16. And then this is really cool. So this is a, what they've called a mixer lead. And the idea is that you can measure four inputs in one go. So we're gonna take a look at that and see how that works. Okay, so I'm gonna start off taking a look at this uh, pull sensor. As I mentioned, you can get that for $16. Today, we're gonna to be using the PicoScope Automotive 4423, uh, feeling a little bit nostalgic. However, these products will work with your 4425A, so the BNC Plus, and they'll also work with your Picoscope 2204A. In fact, they will work with any oscilloscopes that are using the BNC connectors. And if you haven't got a BNC connector, you should be able to just get a uh, converter. Okay, so I've plugged that in. Um, I've just got a little bit of silicon hose here that I use for my uh, pull sensors. That's gonna allow us to actually go inside the intake there and measure the pulses. So what a pulse sensor basically is, is it, it measures pressure pulses um, wherever you stick it. So I did a video on an introduction to pulse sensors a little while ago, so go and check that out if you haven't already. But let's see what we get on the intake of this engine here. So I've just used this hook to help isolate it uh, a little bit from engine vibrations. These are also like vibration sensors, so um, if you do leave them on something and it's, and it's rattling around, you will get a signal from that as well. So we can see here that we've not really got much of a signal going on at the minute, but we are on 20 volts and 20 milliseconds per division. So what we're going to do is reduce that voltage right down because these are quite sensitive little sensors. We can see here now that we've got some readings, okay? We'll also just increase that time a bit. And now what we can see there is these pulses from the intakes inside the engine. So I've just stopped that there and um, I'll save the waveforms. If you want to check the waveforms out, head over to mechanicmindset.com and uh, sign up for the free access area. Uh, I place all the YouTube videos and associated waveform library files and images on there so you can take a look. Also take a look at the monthly membership that we're running at the minute if you want to take your diagnostics to the next level. So what we're basically looking at here is the pulses from the intake system. And that's a pretty good waveform there. Um, I've not got anything to compare it to directly right now, but what we would be looking for is basically, you know, on things like eight valve engines where you get sticking valves or valves not opening, you would actually get a, a gap in that waveform. You can also use it in things like uh, the exhaust system for checking the exhaust valve train side and also inside the uh, expansion tank and the crankcase for checking other kinds of mechanical failures. So one problem we've got at the minute is we don't know which cylinder's which. So what we will take a look at now is one of the other products um, Rocky sent us, and that's the ignition pickup. Now, this is a wasted spark engine, so it's going to be a little bit more difficult for us to identify cylinder one or any individual cylinders. However, we'll connect it up and take a look, and you'll be able to get an idea of what we're looking at. So the idea is they've got a little magnetic pickup inside this sensor here and what you can do is use it to go across your coils and uh, identify coils that aren't being fired. It's a very quick check, 
much like what you would use the uh, PicoScope Paddle Probe for uh, Handtech also make these. So we'll compare that to the PicoScope Paddle Probe and see what the difference is. Now, where Rockkey take this to the next level is they also provide these sensors where they are basically four of the sensors joined into one. So what they do is they supply you with some of this double-sided tape and what you can do is stick it on each of the coils and you might be able to use it on a road test for identifying intermittent problems. So that's pretty cool. This is the uh, four to one that they've sent me here. They also do a six to one and you know again they're really reasonably priced so you know go and have a look. Okay so I've connected this up to channel B so I'm just going to turn channel B on. I'm going to start with one volt because I imagine this is going to be quite a quite a low voltage. Okay, so we've got our pulse sensor signal there. I'm just going to go on this ignition coil here. And what you can see now is we've got those signals from the ignition coil. We're going over range quite a bit, so I'm going to increase that voltage. Okay, there we go. Now we should be able to see that these ignition coil triggers align with those intake peaks. Of course it's not the same cylinder that we're seeing, you would use a different tool to work that out, what's called a cylinder overlay. Let's take a closer look at that little ignition waveform itself. So we'll use the zoom feature here. So basically what we're looking at here is, is the primary side charging and then basically the high voltage side and, and the spark. Now. Um, this looks like it'd be quite difficult to use it for diagnostic purposes, for example, like rich and lean running. However, you can see that you've got those two major events taking place. So the primary side charging, it's getting the trigger from the ECU, and we're also getting some sort of high voltage and spark. So how does that compare to the paddle probe? So let's just make a quick reference image of this. Just go to reference waveforms here. Uh, we want to copy channel B and there we are, we've got a copy of that waveform now. So let's just move out again and we will connect that up to the same channel. So this is the BNC Plus paddle probe, however what you can do is still push that onto the, the older oscilloscope and it will work. Okay, so the paddle probe is connected, we're looking at this red line here. Okay, so we've got a signal there. We might just have to reduce that voltage a bit. Okay, let's stop that waveform. And if we just bring the uh, rock key sensor down next to it, we can compare the two. Now they're not quite aligned and that was because we didn't use a trigger to take the first uh, image, but you can see there that we've got quite different waveforms. In fact, the rock key sensor here actually gives us a little bit more information than that paddle probe. Although the paddle probe is, again, a tool of convenience, just to quickly go on and check those coils to see what's happening. So I'll save this waveform so you can go and check it out in the free access area. Okay, this next tool is really cool, but there are a few things that you need to consider when using it. So what it is, is this four to one mixer lead, okay? So what we've got here is basically four inputs, okay? Now all of those inputs go to the, basically the positive pin inside that BNC connector. So this lead doesn't have a ground connection. So what we're gonna to need to do first is connect up one of our channels to the ground. So if you haven't seen it already, go and check out my channel where we look at floating and common grounds on the oscilloscope. Now, what we're gonna do is connect one of the channels up to a ground with your normal uh, oscilloscope lead, and then we're gonna connect the mixer lead up to channel A and see what we get. Now you might be thinking, uh, well, what if I've got an oscilloscope with floating grounds like the 4425A. Now what you could do is use one of these little uh, BNC splitters, okay? And what that will allow you to do is connect onto that individual channel, connect one of the split leads off to a ground, and then the other one you can connect up the mixer lead. Okay, so we're connected up here. We've got the blue lead connected on channel D of this oscilloscope, and I'm gonna connect that to the ground. So let's... Uh, connect that up there. 
We don't need the positive lead, it's just the ground connection. So we'll just go onto the negative terminal of the battery there. We've then got the mixer lead itself. So we've got these four cables going into these two cables here. And if we follow the cable along, it just goes into one. So they've already got back probes attached and what we're going to do is connect one up to each one of those injectors here. So the oscilloscope is set up at 100 volts. Uh, we've got that 4423, that's the maximum input for this oscilloscope. We've got injectors here and they generally go up to around 50. So if you are using something with a lower input like this, 20 volt input, then you will need to use your attenuator. Don't forget about that. A 20 millisecond time base should capture a few revolutions of the engine as well. So let's see what we've got. Okay, so we've got some stuff going on here. I see we've got some gaps. I might just be missing a connection somewhere. Okay, there we go. Now we can see that we've got all four injectors on one page. And to help put that into perspective, what we'll do is we'll connect up that rock key coil on plug probe. And there we've got, look, Remembering that this is a wasted spark engine. We've got one of the cylinders here. This would be serviced by the other ignition coil. And then we've got the other cylinder here. So here you can see we've got four injectors on one channel. Now there's something a little bit weird going on. Let me turn off the engine and we'll investigate this waveform a little bit more. Okay, so here are our injector waveforms. And if we just zoom into one of these injectors, what we will notice is it's not quite what we would expect from an injector, okay? Bring this down here a bit and we'll just find that zero line. So now here is our zero line, okay? Now what you'll notice is that the injector is activated but it doesn't go all the way down to zero, okay? Now that's because the way that they've had to connect this lead or configure this lead to make it work. Now what this lead will really help us do is look for you know possible intermittent problems where you might not have a fault code or um, an identifiable cylinder for a problem. Um, it would also be quite good for things like diesel engines where you were looking at comparing the time difference between the injections uh, again for different types of problems. Okay, so this is basically how we've got this uh, lead connected up. We've got channel A here, and then the mixer lead splits off to the four injectors. Remember the ground side of the injectors, the switch side. We've then got channel B connected to a ground. Okay, remember we use channel D on our uh, 4423 oscilloscope. The positive lead of that channel is not connected to anything. All we want is a ground for channel A, and we can do that because we've got a common ground, okay? If we do this with a normal lead, so let's say you make your own at home, okay, what's gonna happen is when this injector fires, it's gonna give this a ground, okay? Now, because all these are connected together, it's gonna ground all of the other injectors as well. So every time one of those injectors fire, it's gonna fire every other injector as well, okay? So what Rocky have done is do something quite clever. And Basically, they have added a resistor in the line of each one of the leads, okay? So when that injector fires, it puts it to ground, but the current does flow through to these other grounds. However, because of the resistors, they soak up most of that kind of short-circuited current, but really a very small amount of current flows because of the size of the resistors, and it's not enough to activate the other injectors. So I've shared a few of these products with our Mechanic Mindset members already. Um, they have put orders in and they've been pretty impressed with the products they've received. Again, I can't fault the quality of them really. So get on Rocky website and check them out.